Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report podcast. I'm your host, Vago Maradian. Our podcast is brought to you by Bell. Since 1935, Bell has been redefining flight. Learn more about its pioneering spirit at bellflight.com. More than 200,000 are dead worldwide and more than 54,000 in America from the coronavirus pandemic that has also employed, unemployed more than 26 million Americans uh, alone. The global economy has hit its biggest systemic challenge since the Great Depression as governments struggle with stimulus and safely reopening economies. Lockheed Martin posted blockbuster first quarter earnings, oil prices at a roller coaster week, and Boeing pulled the plug on its deal to acquire an 80% stake in Embraer's commercial jetliner business, a deal that was in negotiation for two years. Joining us to discuss what has been another stunning week is Dr. Rocket Ron Epstein of Bank of America Merrill Litch, Sash Tusa of the independent equity research firm Agency Partners in London, and Richard Abalafia of the Teal Group Consultancy. Gentlemen, welcome back. Great to be here, Vago. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to be here, Vago. Always the highlight of my weekend, Vago. Same here. Uh, before we get started, a quick shout out to our sponsors. Our global coverage is sponsored by Leonardo DRS. Northrop Grumman sponsors our weekly cyber report and our cyber coverage overall. Fincantieri, Marinette Marine sponsors our naval coverage. Elbit Systems of America is sponsoring our trade shows. And Bell sponsors, of course, this podcast. Ron, let me start with you, and I want to get uh, everybody's sense on this as, as well. What are the things that you thought were interesting market-wise, sector-wise, that we saw over uh, the past week on a macro basis. And I want to get all of your guys' macro views before we start diving into, you know, what reopening looks like, right? I mean, folks are saying that the economies may be reopening in May, but social distancing may have to be uh, sort of the, the name of the game even until later this year. What are sort of your big primary thoughts as everybody is struggling with what is an extraordinary collapse in global demand? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple observations. You know, one is if you look at the S and P 500 year to date, um, it's only down about 12 and a half percent, not even a little less than that, which is pretty remarkable given given what's happened. You know, off its highs, it's clearly more than that. But since since the beginning of the year, you're only down, you know, about 12 and a half percent. So you got that. Markets have uh, come back pretty quickly, uh, so they're discounting in. Uh, Probably a more favorable recovery. I think that's, that's probably a fair observation. Two, I think probably the most fascinating thing that happened this week was what happened in energy markets. Seeing the, the May 20th WTI contract close at minus $37 and change was, you know, a, a history making, unprecedented. But it's just remarkable that, you know, that we've gotten to a situation where um, there's such a glut of oil that you're paying people to take it off your hands. Uh, and Brent crude, which is you know, which is what what uh, jet fuel is based on, uh, closed uh, at, at low levels too. So if you look at where the the next contract um, that would be the May twentieth contract for WTI, that's at sixteen dollars and change, and the uh, the Brent crude uh, contract is at twenty one dollars and change. So we're at very 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 low um, levels for oil. And that has you know, re- reverberation effects throughout the global economy. Um, and in particular, in, in aerospace, when airlines start flying again, if oil prices remain um, depressed, um, that, that will help some, right? Because it's, you know, obviously, it's a, it's a huge operating expense for the airlines. But I think what the oil prices are telling you, and what, what I, when I look at oil prices, they can be a, 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 a harbinger of what's to come. And what oil is telling you is that um, the economic recovery will probably be pretty slow. Sash, what are some of your key takeaways? You know, I wouldn't disagree with anything that Ron has said there. I think from a European perspective, um, some of the big uh, European hardware sheds in particular uh, in the UK are starting to reopen. The political pressure uh, in the UK and I think in a lot of other European countries for the uh, the shutdowns to to uh, you start to be lifted is absolutely immense. And you know, there's, there's clearly a trade-off between how many deaths are politically acceptable, particularly when those deaths tend to be concentrated among the old, and certainly in the case of the UK, and very distressingly, among uh, black Asian ethnic minorities, and 
you know, the damage that this whole process is ca causing to the uh, economies themselves. And that, that political pressure, I think, will intensify this week, particularly in the UK, when Boris Johnson is due to, uh, re you know, get back to work again and with a bit of luck start to sort of grip his cabinet a bit. Um, but I think, you know, the oil price is telling us very, very clearly that even if the lockdowns are uh, lifted over the next two, three, four, five, however many weeks, uh, notionally, social distancing isn't going to go away. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult to travel without an, a level of bureaucracy that we're not used to, whether that is checking our health every time we check in and check out, whether that is having some form of um, uh, you know, immunity cards that we carry to show that we've either been checked for coronavirus or that we have actually had it already. Um, and the process of testing, certainly in the UK, and I suspect also in the US, is massively behind uh, what it needs to be uh, for that sort of thing to happen. So air travel is not going to recover materially this year. And the oversupply of aircraft, even at the levels we're at at the moment, is gross. Gross as in... Uh, not disgusting, but gross as in, holy crap, we've got way the hell more airplanes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, there is just far, far, far too much supply of aircraft of any sort for what airlines, which are on their backs, um, assuming that they're actually still, still sort of clinically alive, uh, what, what they need. Um, and we're going to be talking uh, about Boeing and Airbus uh, and, and demand in just a moment. But Richard, let me get your thoughts as well. Completely agree, obviously, with everything uh, my, my colleagues have said there. Yeah, I think people don't understand the, you know, the whole concept of a V-shaped recovery in air travel and in probably every other economic indicator depends upon epidemiological factors. You know, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the virus is the timeline, you know, it, it, that's what sets things here. And, uh, you know, our, our, our current thinking is 2023 for a return to peak, but I've heard opinions from people I deeply respect that say it's, you know, it could be 24 or 25. So this oversupply, yeah, it's, this is absolutely devastating, particularly uh, since it's, it's hard to imagine how you could start gearing the system down all that fast. You're going to have a lot more jets delivered before you hit bottom in terms of you know, in terms of production rates. So uh, th th this industry uh, is in for a, a multi-year downward ride. And when I look at what markets do, you know, I, I don't understand it from, um, you know, half of what Ron understands about them, but it all seems a little bit removed from reality to me because uh, things seem pretty bad when you consider the implications of a, a virus that, uh, that can't be stopped for at least the next 18 months or so. Let me ask about uh, the the new normal, right? We talked a little bit about this, uh, and Richard made a great point that, you know, all of us are in a competitive marketplace. We do need to travel, and then many people will return to travel. But I spent the week talking to a lot of folks in industry who are saying that this, the fact that people are successfully able to work at home means that we may not need to expand office space, that folks can operate and work in a distributed fashion or increasingly from home. There are a lot of people who've told me that they feel that they're actually more productive because they're not spending two or more hours, uh, right? I mean, it's not even two or more hours, but it's also all the time that we invest in getting ready and doing everything else that people don't necessarily have to do. Uh, you can just take a quick shower and then, you know, off you go. You don't have to necessarily spend your time getting as ready as you do uh, to, to have conference calls. And there are others who are saying that at a fundamental level, we've realized that we, can, we don't need to travel as much, especially if it's among teams that know each other well, right? So from a fundamental basis, do, do we have any sense what metric to put on this, that the recovery itself, if it happens, that the market itself may be fundamentally different going forward? May I just uh, use my own personal feelings to illustrate this? I, can't yes, I know, I know how strongly you feel about this. I'm just <laughs> saying that I'm reflecting, I'm reflecting conversations with probably five senior government guys over the past week and a number of very senior industry friends of mine who are actually looking to the fatality of a lot of the trade shows we like, the smaller ones and the conferences, because they said, hey, they really mushroomed, they really proliferated, times were good, it's time to tighten. And, and we're going to be very glad to be seeing the back of some of them. 
Sure. You know, from the standpoint of government, I, I can't speak for that. But those of us in the private sector, which, of course, is the overwhelming majority of air travel demand, it's a simple dynamic. Am I more productive at home? Oh, absolutely. You know, being in my 50s, I'm, I'm kind of geared towards kind of liking it. You know, it's, this is, this is uh, in some ways rather pleasant. Um, am I on equal competitive terms to my competitors? Yep, we're all in the same boat. And we're all doing what we can. You know, I, I'm very privileged to compete with some really good people out there. Some of them are very close friends. Uh, and you know what? When travel opens up again and I don't resume travel and they do, they win, period. <laughs> I got to be mindful of that and so do they. So it's one thing to talk about being productive and efficient in a world where nobody can compete on the basis of travel. And that's the whole point of it, right? But it's quite another story when you can compete on the basis of travel. But, but again, for some of these people, right, they're saying that there are people who do have to travel and get a lot out of it and are key to our competitiveness. But there are in our organizations quite a lot of people who actually travel, but really may not be getting as much out of it at the end of the day. Richard, uh, Ron and, and Sash would, would love to get your guys' sense on this as well. As, because I have, I have a sense the market is readjusting, maybe readjusting itself while we're undergoing this, which means it changes what we see when we get out of it. If I just may jump in, um, and you know, a, a, a single anecdote can be can be dangerous, but I'll I'll, I'll do it anyway. Um, this was a conversation I was having with a um, uh, a friend, a colleague who works in the insurance industry, and they were very proud of the fact that their office space was like stacked so tightly that they were, you know, essentially doing, you know, um, we won't call it hot racking, hot, 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 bunking, hot desking, hot desking. Hot desking. Yeah. Um, and that was an asset, right? Like that we could, they, they could really use their facilities very efficiently. Well, in the current environment, it's not, and that might not be for a while. So, you know, it, I, I think on some level, it'll force companies to, probably rethink how they do floor layouts and how they use their people so on and so forth and a part of that will be most likely those who can work in a more distributed fashion that might become part of the fabric meaning if your office is stacked pretty tight maybe you have office time in different shifts you work at home sometimes you work in the office sometimes so i could imagine a scenario like that playing out I do believe, and maybe because I'm becoming a dinosaur slowly, that there is no substitute for face-to-face -face interaction with a client, with uh, an industry person, with, with whoever. Um, and even if they are contacts that you have a long history with, that you know, every now and then having that cup of coffee is, is meaningful in, in, in keeping that relationship going. So I, I guess I, I kind of fall more into Richard's camp with some modification, you know, is, you know, particularly in a soft economic environment, right? So, you know, clearly when we get into recovery mode, things will be soft. Will companies look at travel budgets? For sure they will, they would have anyway. Um, so in, 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 in this environment, will, will that happen? Of course it will. But when we finally do get back to normal, do I see an environment where the trade shows go away or this or that? They probably become smaller for a while, but eventually they cycle back. That would be my guess. Sash? Yeah, I agree with um, Richard and Ron. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're a small uh, firm. Um, we, want, we need to see our clients. We need to meet our clients. As, uh, you know, as, as um, Ron and Richard said, you know, we need to have a coffee talk to them face to face, that makes all the difference to our business. Um, but are we gonna be more risk averse about how we travel and when we travel? Yeah, you bet. I mean, through the end of the year, definitely, probably into, uh, into next year as well. And are we gonna use our office space differently? Very much. I think you know how all firms use their office space is gonna be different. It's much easier for large organizations, be it governments or, um, firms to make decisions on you know no meetings no consultants and stuff like that um than it is for uh smaller firms and, and smaller consultants and those of us who are you know effectively got our you know trying to build and maintain our own franchises 
Um, and I think that trade shows will be very, very badly affected by this. Much as anything else, there's just going to be a lot of cost control over the next 18, probably 24 months. Um, and, you know, those shows that have had to cancel this year, Farnborough, uh, Riyadh, um, probably Riyadh, I think, will survive. But Farnborough, I'm not sure Farnborough is going to come back. Uh, Eurosatory, the uh, French Land Systems show, I think that's going to come back very, very much smaller. Um, and I wonder whether the, the shape of trade shows globally is going to change. Um, it, you know, if we ended up with the Paris Air Show and the Zhuhai Air Show in, altern in alternating years, would, that, would we be worse off? Probably not. That would reflect, you know, the European focus of the aerospace industry, let's face it, French focus of the aerospace industry, and the Chinese focus of the aerospace industry, and they're going to be the leaders. We'll come back to that. Why, why would you say Farnborough goes away? I know that this has always been kind of a long-running uh, suspicion, but why does Farnborough go away? It's the weakest, it's the weakest of uh, the two European shows. You can't fly aircraft there anymore. So it's an air show with no air display worth talking about. That, is, that fatally wounds it. Frankly, if you're going to do that, you can do the damn thing online. You should be talking to the UK uh, TI and, and Foreign Bureau International folks uh, with, with that one, or, or probably we'll be getting phone calls from them actually come. Well, they, they, need to talk, they need to talk to the CAA about why you can't do an air show at Farnborough when we've had an air show there for 100 years. Yeah, no, 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 that's, that's absolutely true. And that was going to be the big difference this year, correct? Possibly. Uh, alas, it's now immaterial. You know, they've, they've got two years to try to recover. I don't think they will. My sense is, I think that people for whoever are in a competitive job, I completely agree, completely agree with relationships. The most important things that you pick up is a casual meeting with somebody who you didn't expect to run into. You know, either you strike a, a meaningful long-term relationship with them, or at least they give you an insight that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten. But I think that there are some folks who are dialing back on new office construction and leasing in, the, in this period because they're like, hey, people are being very successful working remotely. And there are others who are just coming to the realization that not everybody gets return from that uh, travel. So it's certainly going to be interesting to see. Let's talk a little bit about the capacity issue. A lot of commercial uh, aviation uh, news. Uh, but before we get there, let's talk about uh, Lockheed earnings uh, really uh, quickly. Ron, walk us through what your sense was, because uh, it was a pretty blockbuster quarter for the company. I think we have to mention it was uh, Maryland's last quarter as CEO. Um, so there was uh, a lot of, of discussion around that among analysts. Um, and the quarter itself, um, they reported uh, a, a strong gap number, uh, earnings per share number that was above uh, consensus estimates. Uh, their cash flow looked very strong. Um, they adjusted their revenue outlook for the year modestly. Uh, for concerns around um, uh, the, the coronavirus impact on things like work disruptions and so on and so forth. Their operating margins across the company were, were quite good. So, you know, as you said, it was, a, it was a strong quarter and their outlook was, you know, given, you know, the broader impacts that the virus is having in, in, another, in other industrial sectors was, was, was quite good. Um, I, there was discussion on the call around um, how the DOD is, uh, how, can I, how can I say, putting some pressure on, on uh, the contractors to uh, get some liquidity in the supply chain. And, and Lockheed talked about how you know, they're trying to support some of their um, smaller su suppliers. Uh, and then there was also some you know, conversation about um, future vertical lift and, and how uh, Sikorsky was you know, down selected there. The stuff we've talked about on you know previous podcasts, mm -hmm. so not to repeat that um, in light of time. But so it was you know generally generally a good quarter. Um, no no real surprises, um, and I think it it highlights um, what we're seeing um, in the defense side of the business vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what we will see probably this week in commercial. Um, if you want to bring it up a little bit later, we can talk about some of the the smaller companies that reported this week and what they were saying on commercial, but it really does seem like, you know, the have and have nots in, in terms of defense versus commercial. Richard would like to get your sense uh, and then uh, Sash, uh, your sense uh, as well, uh, including uh, talking to us about Saab's uh, first quarter, but also your uh, read across uh, Talas BAE LDO. Yeah, from my standpoint, it's, it's sort of, 
we have been painfully clear that the only really safe haven in aerospace is defense, particularly U.S. defense. You're starting to see, of course, uh, possible cracks appear in defense budgets elsewhere, but certainly not in the U.S. And Lockheed Martin's riding the F-35 way of 500th, just delivered earlier this year, and uh, that's, you know, not going to stop. If you look at, um, you know, the sort of advice people like us have been giving to aerospace companies, it's, it's sort of interesting, you know, we would have had a conversation, I think, with management suggesting that perhaps, you know, they balance with more commercial work because that's where the long-term growth is. And now, of course, uh, <laughs> it's pretty clear the universe has turned itself on its head and uh, it's all defense all the time. And of course, you also had a week or two ago the, uh, the consummation of the Raytheon Technologies deal, right. which means that uh, United Technologies was suddenly in a much better place. And Raytheon, tech, Raytheon itself was uh, in a somewhat worse place. It's all about your portfolio, isn't it? Uh, that's right. You know, where, what is it? Where you sit is where you stand or, or whatever. Um, Sash, uh, give, us, give us your <coughs> sense uh, on what happened on the U.S. side of things and what we're seeing from uh, and, and your expectations and, and sort of sense on other major European players. I'll focus on the Europeans, but they, but they really do mirror uh, what uh, Ron and Richard said about, uh, about Lockheed. I mean, we had Saab report this week, and 85% you know, of Saab is defense. It makes military aircraft. It makes very, very large integrated systems, certainly by the standards of a, of a small Swedish company. And it was almost a case of nothing to see here move on. Um, they're, you know, Gripen, they're moving up to uh, first production deliveries to Brazil and Sweden at the end of this year. Um, the Global Eye Airborne Early Warning System, uh, first deliveries to the UAE probably this quarter. And they, their surveillance business, which is the, the business that uh, is the prime contractor for that, had an absolutely fantastic quarter. Um, and they were very, very clear that as long as they focus on the big ticket items and you know, social distancing in a military aircraft plant is a lot easier than it is in civil aircraft, for example, and it's certainly a lot easier than it is in, a, in, a, in, a, in an office. So as long as they focus on Gripen, uh, Global Eye, and, you know, to a lesser extent, Carl Gustav, uh, the anti-armor weapon, and, you know, social distancing is built into munitions manufacturer because you don't want too many people in a building if it blows up. Um, if they do that, they can deliver this year's earnings. Now, they've clearly got problems with, and you know, the, the read across there to BA Systems with the Eurofighter Typhoon, uh, to Leonardo with uh, both Typhoon, but also with the trainer aircraft. The pure military aircraft companies in Europe actually look pretty good this year. Uh, it's the civil side of it, which for Saab is about 15%, that is clearly being dragged down. And what was really interesting from Saab was the degree to which when pushed, they admitted they're getting nothing out of the primes whatsoever. They, they are being told nothing. So they just have to wait for the press release like the rest of us. Uh, it's not that they have sort of a, a, a privileged look in. They can make their own uh, you know, decisions, but I think they're very, very concerned uh, about you know, how the civil side of the industry is developing. And now a word from our sponsor. The Defense and Aerospace Report is brought to you by the Bell V280 Valor, bringing the mission technology of the future to the battlefield of today. Visit bellflight.com for more. Let, let's go and talk about commercial aerospace. Uh, obviously, the 737 uh, faces delays. There have been max cancellations. Uh, there's a 777 uh, made news as well. And of course, uh, Boeing called off the Embraer deal. Embraer very, very upset about that uh, and making it very clear. G generally, you don't see one partner call the other one a liar. And that's basically what, what we saw. Uh, and then there was a, a question on, on Airbus orders uh, as well. Um, Ron, why don't you start us off on your sense on going on and means, especially as Boeing prepares to report this coming week? Yeah. So you know, as we think about Boeing's earnings this week, there's a couple open questions. One, um, how much cash will they have? Uh, they had about uh, $10 billion of cash at the end of the year. Um, what will they have now? So, you know, what's their burn rate? That's probably on everybody's mind and that speaks to liquidity. So people will be looking at that. Two, um, they haven't said much about production rates at all. Um, there was some speculation in the press that uh, 787 rates could get cut in half, which would make sense, but that hasn't come directly from Boeing, at least not yet. Um, this week, uh, Hexel reported, Moog reported, 
among other companies, but those two in particular we were watching. And um, in the discussion uh, they had with investors, they were saying how they have gotten no guidance from Boeing. Like they're flying blind uh, in terms of uh, production rate estimates where Airbus has at least taken a first crack at it. And probably we would all agree on this call that was a, a, a first look at it. There's probably more cuts coming. Right. Um, not to put words in anybody's mouth, but we haven't gotten anything out of Boeing, right? So the supply chain right now seems to be flying blind. So there's going to be um, an eye on that. Um, and I think that's probably, probably the most important piece is liquidity and where production rates are going. Um, the, the deal between Boeing and Embraer, it falling apart, ultimately isn't really all that surprising. Um, given the most likely stressed financial situation on Boeing's balance sheet, they sadly were not in a position probably to do the deal. Um, and that's why they're not. Further, if they were to uh, get some sort of U.S. government money, doing any deal, let alone a foreign deal, probably wouldn't look very good um, or be impossible. So as a precursor to that, they, they probably couldn't do it anyway. Um, and then there's maybe some strategic things around, are they even going to do a new airplane? What would the JV do for them now? So on and so forth. Um, why it didn't happen. So, you know, that's, I think, another, another big thing uh, we, we saw this week. Uh, and then maybe the third point, and then I'll, I'll pass it on, is it did come out late in the week that, you know, 737, it looks like the certification for it is yet delayed another two months, something like that. So we're talking August, September timeframe now. Um, which, yeah, I guess there's no rush at this point. Um, 737 MAX almost seems like an afterthought from a different mm -hmm. you know, century, but it, it does seem like it was delayed for two months. Richard, why don't we go to you and then um, get Sasha's take on the market? A bit of an interesting juxtaposition between Airbus and Boeing. Um, you know, Airbus has been really upfront about its production uh, uh, rate reductions and, and with likely further ones to come. Whereas Boeing hasn't said a thing, probably this week they'll, they'll come out and say it. But what is interesting is that Airbus has announced very few outright cancellations. They've alluded to deferrals, but Boeing has lost, I think so far this year, like about 300 orders and, and heading north of there. And part of it is vulnerability of the MAX, but on the other hand, uh, it's not like they're defecting to Airbus. So maybe, you know, to put a positive spin on it, maybe they're simply being more upfront about backlog changes because uh, right. Airbus does have a tendency to keep it, you know, permafrost on its backlog. You know, there are many uh, anecdotal examples, but it's also possible <laughs> that the, uh, you know, the, the legendary ANA A340s that persisted despite the fact that they were, you know, zombie turkeys, you know, for like 15 years, uh, but, you know, you, you can't, know, you can't, you can't ship that apparently through the postal service. Zombie turkeys can't be shipped. Uh, yes, yes, done. you can. I know because I've tried. And, oh, and, really? And works yeah, 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 yeah. But the, uh, the whole concept of, uh, you know, that, well, part of it might just be transparency in order books. And part of it might be that the max's competitiveness is somewhat eroding. What's a little concerning is when uh, China's CDB uh, canceled a bunch of Maxes this week. They also converted their Max 9s and 10s into Max 8s, the remaining ones. And uh, that's concerning because Boeing continues to lose more and more ground in that middle market segment, the 200 seat segment, to the A321neo. So I think there's no way uh, they can or should be able to have uh, their announcement this week. Uh, without dealing with this this other elephant in the corner, just the complete growing Airbus dominance in this uh, this crucial market segment. Sash, your take? Uh, first of all, I we just don't believe there is such a thing in civil aerospace as a firm order. I think the concept of a firm order and a firm or an order backlog is absolute bull. Um, a firm order is just an option. Uh, it's the right. To, for that airline to take delivery of the aircraft at a certain date, but it certainly isn't the obligation. They can always move. And Richard's right. You know, Boeing is, Boeing is canceling stuff. Airbus is just deferring stuff. They desperately want to keep the customer. They want to keep the customer relationship. And if that means that they defer the uh, order five, six, seven years out, they'll do so. And, you know, that, that's a way of doing business. But our calculations show that 
well over a third and probably nearly 40% of the A320 NEO uh, family backlog is now for delivery well past 2025, i.e., you know, um, it, it's becoming uh, irrelevant. But Airbus will, I think, cancel as a last, uh, you know, a last option only. Um, uh, I raise um, uh, Richard's ANA A340s and I give him the Iraqi Airways A310s, which stayed on the Airbus uh, order book for decades. Uh, I mean, actually, you know, these were ordered before the invasion of Kuwait um, uh, and they stayed on the Airbus order book until the A310 finally went out, uh, you know, ceased um, existence. So, you know, that, that, that shows the degree to which the so-called backlog is a, uh, a meaningless uh, spreadsheet, albeit one that is still tremendous fun to, uh, to look at. Um, I, uh, my worry, I mean, I, you know, I think our big takeaway about the collapse of the Embraer deal and it comes back to the point that Richard made about the, the max becoming very, very quickly um, I, well, both irrelevant and uncompetitive, and I worry about the latter the most, um, is that the Embraer deal was supposed to be the, the secret source that would uh, get Boeing the next generation narrowbody. The Brazilians would invest in it. The Brazilians would do the engineering work on it because they've got lots of super bright young uh, engineers who are pretty match fit because they've done a lot of new aircraft recently. And that deal has not only collapsed, it's exploded in acrimony. So where's Boeing going to get the money from? Where's Boeing, to get Boeing going to get the engineering resource from? Um, you know, next generation narrowbody is dead. And I think I've never thought it more clearly that Boeing has lost and Airbus has won. That doesn't make me want to invest in civil aerospace um, because I think this cycle is going to be utterly brutal. But I think coming out of it, Boeing's position is unarguably a weak second. It just looks like McDonnell Douglas did pretty much at the time that they converted the uh, DC-10 into the MD-11. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a tragedy for the US, frankly. Um, does this precipitate, uh, Sash, the horror scenario that you have predicted, and Richard, you've discussed this well, where that dynamic is no more, no longer even 60-40, but is maybe 35-65 or even 30-70, in which case, you, you know, you don't want to say it's all over, but I don't know if anybody has ever come back from that kind of a deficit. They've built up right as 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 Airbus did right you can grow into that market which was uh, you know obviously there was a lot of state support and everything else that went into that but but do you think that this is this this accelerates that downward pressure on the company oh it, it it's happened it's there um, the only way that Boeing comes back from this is with a tremendous amount of state support. It basically needs to be renationalized. The advantage of that would be that the Boeing board wouldn't be messing things up anymore um, because they've got the company into this problem and they got the company into this problem with the decision on the max, with the decision to continue to do buybacks and with actually, you know, messing up product strategy pretty consistently. Um, uh, nationalization and the capital that comes with that is what's needed to get that Boeing back to 50% of the market. Very, very hard to see them doing it otherwise on their own, um, particularly now that the Brazilians uh, are quite rightly going off somewhere else in a massive hub. Ron and Richard, you guys want to make a comment on Sasha's thesis? Well, I think, yeah, you can't, you can't write off Boeing completely largely because it's, it's too big to fail, right? It's still largest exporter from the US. And you know, when we talk about national champions, um, Boeing's one of them. Um, I believe Zosh is right. I mean, that they'll need some sort of support. Um, you know, that support typically is rife with some sort of moral hazard, right? Uh, so I don't know how the, uh, the corporate governance will work around that kind of support, but um, they went into this unprecedented downturn flat-footed um, and that's going to hurt them through this, right? It's in some ways, it's almost inconceivable that the Boeing company, as we know it, as we knew it 18 months ago, wouldn't be able to finance a $4.2 billion deal with Embraer where 18 months ago, the share was, would move more than that in a day, just in you know, an average trading day. Um, where that $4.2 billion just didn't seem like that much liquidity that we're in a situation where it actually is now. Um, 
So that's, you know, it's, I, 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 I'm with Sash. Unless some dramatic things happen, um, they will most likely come out of this downturn um, in second place. Richard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Boeing, of course, it's too big to fail. You know, on the other hand, nothing, uh, particularly in a free market economy, is too big as to not be on a multi decade downward Clyde slope to seeding market leadership, which I think is the real issue here. No, they're not going to fail. They'll be fine. Uh, will they be exactly what Sash described? Yeah, it, it sure looks like it. It's incumbent upon them to prove, uh, to prove us wrong. Launch something new. It's, they just went an entire decade without launching anything new, no new clean sheet design. And they very glaringly obviously need one. And, and given what they've been doing with their cash, for some time now and what they'll resume doing with their cash as soon as they've got, you know, a couple of nickels to rub together. Uh, it's pretty clear that without that kind of pressure, they're not going to do something new and they really need to. So let's find out. Uh, and if they don't, well, from, yes, it's, it's really tough to recover from a downward glide slope to, to 30%. And when we have this conversation, hopefully it's still the three of us or our three younger replacements in 10 or 15 years. Too big to fail will be irrelevant. It'll just be well on its path to being McDonnell Douglas circa 1995. Uh, which uh, is, is just a, a kind of a heartbreaking prospect. Let me ask you guys this question. Where do we stand, Ron, uh, or anybody else who knows the question about whether or not Boeing is actually going to take aid or not? Because so far the company has resisted doing that. Where are we on that? Because uh, Dave Calhoun regularly has sort of suggested that we're, you know, we're going to go to the street, we're going to finance from capital markets uh, as opposed to turning to the government. Yeah, so far it's, it's, it's unclear, right? Um, there's been discussion in the market that something would happen. There's been discussion that they've been positioning themselves, but it's, it's been very, very quiet. Um, and this week we have, you know, two important events, right? There's a shareholder meeting, one and two, um, earnings. So between those two events, maybe we'll learn more about, you know, any government involvement, if there's government involvement. Um, I'm reasonably confident if they went to the capital markets, they could raise money, but then the question becomes at what expense, right? It, given the current environment, given what's going on. Um, I would imagine the debt capital markets would want to be compensated, um, but it would be possible to raise money. You know, if I could just add to that, um, it seems that um, there's a bit of a disconnect here because one thing that has been a stumbling block in addition to a government equity stake is, is also headcount retention provisions. And here, here's the thing, it, it, with the election coming up in November, I think this has probably got to be a very high priority for the administration, headcount retention to avoid even worse unemployment from, uh, you know, making things look bad in the run up to November. Uh, and yet, if uh, I were Boeing management, uh, behaving like Boeing management, that is the absolute worst no-no, that they are going to insist upon the right to, uh, as they've done in the past, decimate the ranks of their workforce with, uh, with uh, this coming downturn. So I'm not really sure how both sides can uh, find an agreement there. Sash? Yeah, so I, I look, I, I think Ron and Richard are absolutely right. And I'm mean to, you know, to, to circle back on two points they've made there. If Boeing is going to raise money from the capital markets, they're going to have to be honest about production rates. And they haven't even started yet. Um, and uh, the other thing they're going to have to be absolutely honest about is what the... Um, what the margin outlook, i.e. the profitability outlook, is for the company two, three, four years out. And this idea that you can uh, support a civil, or you know, have a civil aerospace business that is a, you know, a weak number two and having to claw its way back through product development and through, frankly, discounting the aircraft you've got just to keep production up over the coming years and so forth, that is the sort of thing that uh, generally uh, gives us a company making somewhere in middle, mid single digit margins, not margins in the teens. And Airbus shareholders had to accept that for a couple of decades. Um, Boeing shareholders haven't had that problem you know, in living memory. But if 
Boeing is going to recover from this. Its margins are going to be a fraction of what they were before. And they've got to start being open about that in terms of, if not guidance, certainly in terms of the messaging they send to the market. I think it's, a re I think it's really hard to raise money from the uh, capital markets when capital market expectations are fundamentally wrong about Boeing's volumes and Boeing's profitability. Any other parting thoughts before we disband? I guess I'll just uh, follow on to the Embraer discussion. It's really interesting, um, you know, certainly the, the timing, uh, the circumstances all seem to point to, uh, you know, Boeing having, well, uh, changed sentiment and changed circumstances about the deal. But, but Boeing's been pushing back very strongly against that. So given that the uh, contract calls for arbitration in the aftermath of the broken deal, it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out. Um, it's going to be a real, well, he said, she said story, uh, but hopefully it'll be transparent. And, you know, I, th I think it'll be a fascinating moment in history. I do believe they really wanted to do the deal, right? I mean, they, they were very clear about that from the beginning. They were very clear about that through the entire 737 crisis, that not doing the deal would be kind of a last resort, that they would cut their dividend, they would, you know, cut the buyback, and it would just be a last resort. And that's really how it played out, right? I mean, it was the last thing that they've done. I mean, there might be other things, but relative to other capital deployment um, avenues, it was a lever. I do believe they wanted to do it, and they got into a situation where they just couldn't do it. And given the current environment and some of the other stuff we talked about, Maybe it doesn't even make sense to do it at the moment. Um, I did think, however, maybe they would want to delay it. Maybe say, we'll do it next year, whatever, when things get a little better, uh, we'll maybe think about it. Um, but it, I, I think it does point to potentially how dire things are that it, it came to this for them. Um, so, uh, you know, so we'll see. We'll We'll see this week for sure. But um, yeah, I, 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 I do believe it was, um, it's unfortunate that, you know, the, the marriage of these two companies, you know, could have been maybe a beautiful thing. You never know, you know, well, some marriages end a divorce, but could have been a nice thing. We'll never know. And, and the other point I would make, you, you have a bride who is ready to get married. The company's two companies now. There's duplicates of right. back office. Right. Who's to say that you won't have another suitor come in? And I'm not saying that's going to happen, but they're in a position where they could do a deal pretty quickly. Um, and just a thought experiment, a, a concept, an idea. Imagine if Comac came in, that'd be a black eye, clearly, because they'd be getting their hands on a very capable airplane company. So I don't know. I mean, just let's watch where this goes. But um, it's it's unfortunate they played out this way. Uh, yeah, it, very unfortunate, especially given how important. Right, and we ended up with with this because of a trade action that Boeing was backing and pressing the Trump administration to doing vis-a-vis -vis Canada, driving Bombardier into the arms of Airbus, and as a consequence, ending up with uh, you know doing a deal. You know, I mean, they're, the company's own actions precipitated some of these outcomes. And that's, I think, what's the most baffling and frustrating. Guys, thanks very much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. And we'll have you back on next week. Thanks, Saga. Thanks, Margo. Great to be here, Margo. And thanks for joining us this week. Please follow our daily interviews with top government, military, industry, and thought leaders at Defense and Aerospace Report, and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Follow us on Twitter at Def Aero Report. That's at the F-A-E-R-O Report. Like us on Facebook at Defense and Aerospace Report. And check us out on LinkedIn. Look for our weekly cyber report sponsored by Northrop Grumman. For more than 80 years, Bell has pushed past the boundaries of what's possible to drive aviation forward, going above and beyond flight, bellflight.com. Thanks again to Bell for their generous sponsorship, and we'll see you again tomorrow.